Let's start. I think it's always a good way to introduce. So my name is Hassan Nasser. Hi, everyone. I'm the vice president of the uh, International Affairs for the Digital Cooperation Organization, the DCO, which is an international organization based out of Riyadh, bringing to together 11 member states to uh, accelerate the growth of the digital economy in an inclusive and sustainable way, to enable prosperity for all. And that's really our mission, and that's why we are here bringing you together uh, today. We have heard yesterday, today, and we'll hear tomorrow, yes, the global economy is facing challenges. That's fine, we, we've heard enough. And it was shaped by COVID-19 pandemic, then geopolitical tension, persistent inflation, cost of living crisis, you name it. But what we know in this situation, by harnessing the potential and the opportunity of the digital economy can really address the issues. Studies estimate that more than 70% of the total economic value over the next decade will be created through digitally based business model. So that gives us the solution. Yeah. We have the solution. We know that that's where we need to focus. The digital economy will also bring a lot of opportunities in terms of job creation, customer experience, supply chain improvement, you name it. And we have a lot of opportunities to discuss that. However, and that's why this year was created, at the same time we see the growth of the digital economy, we also see markets, populations, and individuals left behind. So last number, 2.9 billion population are still, still don't have access to internet. Mm -hmm. So how do you want to grow this digital economy with this gap? And 96% of these people are living in developing world. Mm -hmm. in the developing world. But it's not only the problem of the developing world because when we go to industrialized country, you see age divide, you see a lack of access in rural areas, still challenges in terms of reskilling or upskilling. So we have an issue, the global economy. We believe we have a solution yeah. by continuing the acceleration of the inclusive and sustainable growth of the digital economy. But we know and we have to recognize we have very big challenges. So we are here today in this lab. You know, in the lab, we try to create new ideas and new solutions <coughs> to think together. They will probably know there will be no final answer when we leave the 40 minutes <laughs> together, unfortunately, but hopefully we will create, we will connect some dots, some brains with the panelists, with me, and also the audience. So for the panel today, I'm very pleased to, to welcome, I will go with Mr. Ahmed El Zaini, co-founder and CEO of Foodix. We have uh, Mr. Fadi Randour, managing partner at Wanda Capital, Mrs. Jen Lui, former head of Uber and TikTok in China. I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong. Huh? I'm not a professional moderator, sorry for that. <laughs> I continue with uh, Dr. Klaus Hommel, uh, founder and chairman of Lexstar, and uh, Mr. Pierpaolo Barbieri, founder and CEO of Walla. Walla sounds a bit local. I know. So I don't know if it's on purpose. And uh, Mrs. Nena Nwakanma, chief web advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation. So just as a warm-up, warm up, if I can ask you a big round of applause for the panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, my job is done. <laughs> I will ask each of you now to, to, let, to let us know a bit more about what's your scope, where are you positioning, and more importantly, what do you do today in this space of the growth of the digital economy, okay? So one of you, each of you, one minute, I will be very strict on time. <coughs> uh, who wants to start? Can we do the same? Yeah. OK, we'll go that way. Please. So thank you for uh, having me. Uh, so basically, Foodix, uh, we are uh, digitalizing the F&B industry. Uh, since we founded the company back in 2014, we increased the adaptation of technology 150% uh, uh, back then. Uh, especially we play a very major role in, during COVID. Uh, so uh, if uh, COVID hit the industry uh, eight years ago, uh, the impact of the uh, industry was really severe, severer than what, what, what uh, we 
we attempt uh, due to the digital uh, uh, adaptation uh, of the industry, having the uh, payment, digital payment uh, company that providing and supported by the central banks in the region, uh, food delivery companies, and also the uh, 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 wallets uh, that we have in the industry. So basically, Foodex plays a major role in connecting the ecosystem with the merchant and the restaurant owner, and uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, plays a very major role with the government to empower uh, uh, the small business owners uh, um, that uh, plays a major uh, uh, role in the uh, contribution in the country as well. So we know that 85% uh, uh, of the uh, uh, restaurant F&B industry are small and micro businesses, while um, the, 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 the uh, cash cycle is less than 21 days only. Mm -hmm. So if, if, uh, if the uh, small business and micro businesses didn't utilize well the uh, solutions, they will run out of cash and business closure uh, rate will become uh, uh, higher than uh, uh, possible than before. Excellent. So Good. you've already dropped a lot of keywords that we will use during the conversation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yes. So I'm, uh, unlike him, uh, my friend here, I, I am in the business of investing in companies that are uh, at a very early stage in the digital landscape across uh, the emerging markets, but, but core of it is, is the areas we're in here, GCC and and the rest of the uh, of the Arab world. Uh, so we, we think of ourselves as enablers, as such. So investors mm -hmm. and 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 a sort of a value add to help these companies at a very early stage uh, become as big as as Foodex, hopefully. But uh, more importantly for me is that uh, I've spent uh, close to two decades working with uh, young students in several markets outside of uh, of the GCC where we work with students at college age uh, through an education process uh, to upskill them and to enable them with capabilities outside of what they learn in universities which means uh, bringing uh, the digital knowledge to them uh, and connecting them to, to the 21st century economy uh, as such. So that's uh, where I feel my contribution to this panel is, uh, is going to be focused uh, effectively. So working with people that are at the core yeah. of not being digitalized. And so uh, we lived through live through that experience of being uh, outside of the digital landscape when, when the pandemic hit. So we yeah. know the pain uh, of what happens to students uh, when they suddenly have to pay high amounts of money to be going to school through, yeah. through, uh, through, uh, through distance learning. Great, thank you very much. We'll come back to that, as you say, yeah. core in the conversation. Jen. Oh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I used to help Uber to grow in China, and then I led the efforts of ByteDance to expand globally and grow TikTok to become the most fast growing app, social media app globally. And today I'm still advising companies, especially tech companies to go globally. And it's become more and more uh, complicated to navigate in the landscape. Yeah. yeah, exactly complicated. We will see how and why. Klaus. Yeah, <coughs> so uh, Klaus, uh, thank you for having me as well. So as I'm running a VC fund in continental Europe, it's not so much about the access to the internet. It's more like, how do you um, create businesses? And there are several levers to that. First of all, is a lot with education. So we go to universities and explain technology students how venture works. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that they lose a little bit the anxiety to become self-employed as it is so easy. And then if they have the ideas, yeah, we are very happy to make then big companies that then build the next backbone for, for the future. Yeah? So, and we were happy there. We did Skype, King, Klarna, Spotify, 
so most of the big ones in, in Europe. So there has already been a big contribution from those companies for, for European um, technology. Great, thank you very much. Jeff Bauer. Um, I come from a region of the world where over 50% 50, 50 of adults have no access to financial services, so they live yeah. in cash. And I firmly believe that we cannot ask people to believe in capitalism, an opportunity, without giving them access to the future economy. So we provide free digital accounts for everyone, so a debit card and account for everyone, uh, without opening fees, maintenance fees, or renewal fees. And we have bank licenses in Argentina, a country of 45 million people, Mexico, a country of 135 million people, and Colombia, a country of 45 million people. And we're working on a couple more, uh, because we, and, and so we onboard between 250 and 300,000 people a month. And then we offer a variety of services from the card into credit history, your first loan, investment products, insurance products, and also um, uh, loyalty products to allow you to build a successful and healthy financial life. And over 50% of the people that we add every month have never had a card before. So we, a big pillar of that is financial education. So I'm not convincing you to drop your traditional bank I'm convincing you to drop cash. And I'm convinced that in 10 years there will be no cash other than you know, maybe the constitutional right to keep cash. And we're moving to economies like in China where 70% or 80% of transactions are digital. So we need to help that. And through merchant acquiring services, we're now helping small businesses digitize as well. Amazing. Thank you very much. Nina. Thank you, DCO, for having us. Um, happy to meet all of those who are creating digital prosperity. My part of this section is for all. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that no one is left out. Um, the UN says leave no one behind. At the World Wide Web Foundation, we use the hashtag for everyone. The World Wide Web Foundation was founded by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. And in the spirit of the internet, the internet is not the web. The internet existed before the World Wide Web. They had the vision that if humanity is given this technology, we will use it for our good, for creating digital prosperity. And I'm happy that my esteemed co-colleagues are doing that. Our role at the Web Foundation is to be legacy holders of that vision. And every time we keep asking the question, is it for everyone? Does it include everyone? Is everyone able to access it? So that hashtag for everyone, is our own part of uh, of engagement. I am the chief web advocate. I go to Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, everywhere, and I listen and I check and I ask the relevant questions and I give advisory at policy level. I collaborate with the Office of the UN Tech Envoy and the General Assembly Presidency to ensure at every step that digital prosperity is actually available beneficial to everyone, and that we are safe, secure, online. Very clear. So I think now, if we are in a lab or a kitchen, we have the ingredients to cook all together. Uh, this year, over the last seven months, has convened global roundtables. So we went to Kigali, Santiago de Chile, uh, New York, Brussels, Bangkok to listen to experts and to ask them what are the local barriers, the regional barriers to uh, access to the digital economy. So the participants have uh, identified three main areas of focus, uh, the infrastructure, the people and talents, and the markets, mm -hmm. the dynamic of the market. And I think we have touched a lot of elements here. And we will probably continue this conversation moving from one to the other, but of course I've been given some structure by the team, I need to follow that. So I will start with the first question on uh, the World Wide Web Foundation. Sorry, let's come back to you. Out of these three areas, and based on your visit in different countries, the discussion with different stakeholders, from your perspective, what is the biggest challenge to enable prosperity for all through the digital solution and digital economy, if you look at the infrastructure, the people, talents, and market. And there is no good, bad answer. Of course, we will discuss. <laughs> and so in New York, I was on in table eight. Ah, you remember. <laughs> I was on table eight with um, 
the Assistant Secretary General from the UN and the, minister, the Honorable Minister from Jordan, yep, if, if I recall. So I was part of that co conversation. No, I will step away from those three. I will say the human being. The human uh, is the biggest challenge, and, and I'll explain why. I'm a policy strategist, and what I find out in listening, whether it's infrastructure, it's human development, if we don't have the right vision at the policy level, we won't go anywhere. And so, um, if you, when I get into a country, even before I get into a country, when I brief at the airport, I can tell you whether that country has categorized technology as a social issue, as a youth issue, as an economic issue, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we are in Saudi Arabia. We are at the Investment for the Future Summit. And Saudi Arabia is telling us about a new world order. That is where investment is targeted. You could go to somewhere else, and they are looking at technology for state capture and state sovereignty. So for me, the biggest barrier may, can be seen in these three, but at the top of it is still the policy vision of the governing, uh, of the governing um, structure. Mm -hmm. Do you want to see digital creativity and creation as prosperity for all? Do you want to use it for transforming the country? Do you want to use it for service? Do you want to use it to grow the market? Do you want to use it to keep the president in power? Or do you want to use it to make sure that women will not rise? That's the question. So you're answering my question with more questions. Yes, sir. Thank that's you why I'm much. here. You're not making my life easy. <laughs> no, but I'm that's here okay. To make you Let's suffer. see with the other panelists if they're helping me a bit. Uh, I'd like to look at the so the vision. We need a vision to, to move and to address in the proper way the issues we have identified. Um, so let's have a look from a, a funding perspective, an investment perspective. Uh, that's very clear in all the discussion we have had glo globally that investment is needed for smaller business, build infrastructure, develop talents. So what uh, for you, Klaus, what are you doing more specifically in that space when it comes to supporting or growing the entrepreneurship or the in digital entrepreneurship across Europe? <coughs> so, as I said before, it's not so much on the infrastructure layer, mm -hmm. right? Because with, with wealthy telecoms and pretty much developed uh, infrastructure investments, that is all done. So <coughs> the, the beauty of the digital economy is because you have platforms, everybody can reach everybody in the world. So the acceleration of businesses is, um, is pretty universal. So you need to make sure that you start with entrepreneurs that discover something in their daily life which they think there's an insufficiency and they try to solve that with technology. And then you need to basically frame every effort that the entrepreneur does with the, the capabilities that the young guys could not have, meaning mm -hmm. to help them with regulation, they have never hired, they have never built organization. So these are support infrastructure elements uh, by building companies. But I think it is a, a lot is also by making sure you have efficient hubs. Why are hubs important? If you are in the middle of nowhere and build your company, you go out in the evening and there's nobody with whom you can exchange. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are in Berlin, if you are in Stockholm, if you are in Paris, you go out and in every bar there are other entrepreneurs. So you have a, like a self-correction mechanism via the, the hub ecosystem where people exchange and exchange meaning newbies don't make the same mistakes twice. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the, the framework that an e ecosystem can provide. So to answer your question, so it is e education at the universities uh, um, and make sure that we provide to the entrepreneurs the adjacent capabilities that he doesn't have. And how do you generate these hubs? <coughs> Where what the? How the do hubs? you create these hubs? <coughs> Look, I mean, it is more where do you, uh, the apps are currently there, mm -hmm. and the question is just if you say to people that found in nowhere, yeah. so pack your stuff and move to the hub. 
Okay. Yeah, so it is more like, uh, I think it is, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how much self-correcting and self-motivating energy gets out of hubs. Before we go to the entrepreneurs, from, from your perspective, Fadi, is it different from what we hear from Europe in terms of building the entrepreneurship, building the new entrepreneurs? Okay. What are the challenges you've seen in the region? So I'm going to take your original question. And uh, there's no question that we're, there's a difference where emerging markets and, and, and emerged yeah. markets. And, uh, and there are lots of commonalities, but I want to go back all the way down to basics, if you want. So if we're talking about uh, pro digital prosperity for all, mm -hmm. so focusing on the all, and then going back to basics to making sure being digitally connected is a human right, right, for all citizens. And so like we have light, we have water, access mm -hmm. to water, access to light, so access to uh, being digitally uh, not connected, enabled. Yeah. So, uh, and there's a difference. So you can be connected, uh, but you need to transact also. So, which means, uh, like my friend here talked about, so, uh, financially included through the digital landscape because that's, you know, being connected digitally uh, gets you to leapfrog building infrastructure in the uh, bricks and mortar world and gets you able to be connected through, through a device that you hold with you, whoever you are, wherever you are, in a small village, mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of nowhere, or in, in a big city and a mega city, wherever you are. So, all of this with all due respect to investors, and I'm an investor, it's not an invested investment uh, mentality that should happen. This is the role of the state. Uh, look, the digital economy in the, in the West, specifically, when you go to the United States of America, was created because of the state. So we don't want to forget the role of the state because uh, the rest of the world leap frogs and talks about entrepreneurship, and I am one of the preachers of yeah. entrepreneurship, but I don't want to get the state uh, a buy on this. They can't leave it to us. They have to build the infrastructure for the citizen. And then the entrepreneur sits on top of that infrastructure and creates new types of value. But the state needs to create a system where the citizen is connected and enabled and able to transact online, learn online, buy online, uh, and get entertained online, it becomes uh, a basic uh, uh, requirement. Uh, 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 For that, 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 yeah, look, I mean, um, this is the reason for that. This is the, the value is societal uh, uh, rather than necessarily a, a business value. So the returns are societal returns, uh, social returns. The pandemic taught us a huge lesson. Mm -hmm. and said, if you're not digitally connected, you're outside, you're, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all the uh, big uh, uh, consulting firms that come and give advice to our government, uh, the pandemic gave us the conclusion at a much cheaper price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, because it told them all, uh, stop studying this story and understand that you need to be digitally connected and it needs to be an infrastructure play that is provided by the state. And we need to talk about the role of the state here, and the state should have been part of this panel, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, they, they uh, really, at the end of the day, uh, you either make it on a BOT basis, or uh, uh, you build it yourself and make sure that your citizens are connected. Because, uh, for instance, in our region, most of our schools are public schools. Mm -hmm. The state is the provider of education. So what happens when you are disconnected in a pandemic? Mm -hmm. It ends up an extra cost on a family that is not capable of, of paying for that. Uh, I know that because we work in marginalized communities. And what happened is when, they, when the parents wanted to make sure that their kids are attending class, yeah. it's, uh, it's the difference between being over the poverty line and under the poverty line, if a new extra cost comes to you to make sure that your kids are having access to that little iPad that gets them access to their class, right? And so who bears the cost? So when, the, when, 
when the physical infrastructure is built, is built for the kids to walk to the school and go to the class, it's a class. But when the class becomes digital, you have to provide the connectivity for free. And not say, I'm going to provide it to you at a lower cost. No, it's not a lower cost. It's for free. You have to make it for free because it's a human right, because that's when you're investing in the future of your kids. I mean, that's, uh, that's the theme that is most essential when we discuss that. And then entrepreneurs can come, you can create hubs, uh, prosperity can happen. And we see a lot of these things are happening, like Foodix and so many other companies yeah, in exactly. developed in countries, in, in areas and in cities that are prospering already. Right? So he's yeah. able and he connects people and he makes them digitally connected. But there's a layer beyond that. So not all people are at that layer. We yeah. may need to make sure that we bring that layer up so that there's a sort of a level playing field. I mean, I'm not, a, uh, this is not a, uh, a utopia here. No, no. There needs to be. There is a direction. Uh, there is need from to be a, a layer government. playing field so that uh, everybody plays in that field and then whoever is creative can build whatever he needs to build. But, but that layer needs to be risen to a level. Yeah. Uh, that gets uh, everybody to participate uh, and participate fairly. Yeah. Participate fairly. Thank you very much. And so I think we will come back to this point. And you're right, we don't have governments here today, but we have governments everywhere. No, no, I'm, and I'm, we have I'm, governments I'm just saying because governments need to be engaged. Exactly. And, and exactly. actually, everything we talk about digitally, uh, and is, even my friend here, if, he's not, if he doesn't get licensing, he's not going to be able to play. And the license, it comes <laughs> from the government anyway. Yeah, so even if they're not here, we actually feel them very, very exactly. strongly. <laughs> and yeah, we will definitely. also bring a lot of <laughs> message to them. I'd like to hear now to two people who have been obviously uh, digitally enabled, not just connected. You, you went beyond to create your own, uh, your own project and to deliver value to the, to the society, to the community. Um, let's say, again, I'd like to be specific. I would like to, for the audience to leave with something to, to think about. What should be the, the lessons learned? What have been the, the key challenges you've faced? And what would you change if you had to do it again? Let's say you go back at the at inception of the project. What would you do differently to make sure that you're moving faster, you're more agile, or you just get more success with the, with the project? Uh, who wants to start? Pierre Paolo? Ah, yeah. no worries. Don't so be too gentleman. So basically, <laughs> our, we are uh, lucky to start the, uh, the business in the same start of the Vision 2030. So mm -hmm. I really experience the, the government support pre and post of the course. 2030 uh, uh, Vision. So when the, uh, when the company is founded in 2014, the ecosystem of funding and venture uh, capital wasn't available there. Even the definition of entrepreneur wasn't available back then. So we, when I founded the company, it's a, it was a side business for me. Because my father told me, you need to go and run Aramco. <laughs> course, <laughs> yeah. so. Today, the, the situation is really different. How central bank in Saudi Arabia are really empowering digital payment, for example, when we got the license, I thought, because what I heard from the old school of, of, uh, of uh, Central Bank, that licensing, the licensing takes more than a year in order to get a license or even to get acceptance. So when I applied for the license in, in the middle of 2019, I assumed that I get the license in 2020. Actually, I, I got the first meeting in a week. Ooh. I get admitted in the uh, sandbox in less than a month. I graduated in three months from the sandbox. So, and thanks for the, 20, uh, the, the, uh, the COVID, because COVID really pushes all of the in, uh, uh, entrepreneurs that enabled the digital, right. such as Foodix, to accelerate the full licensing. So, Due to COVID, actually we got the full license by the central bank and become a, a, a large fintech company in six months. Wow. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> that's right. thank, you. thank you. So basically, uh, this is how Fadi just mentioned that the government contribute yeah. in, 
entrepreneurs and startups, totally. and here we can make a value as well. So that, what would you make differently then? Faster? Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> exactly. Okay. So b before before uh, COVID, uh, we was only providing one product, which is the RMS, the restaurant management system, inventory, kitchen management, and so on. During COVID, we we uh, uh, accelerated and has four products. Uh, for this capital and payment and uh, the RMS and online and this and uh, answering your question I wasn't think I was thinking that everything has to become uh, 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 gradually mm -hmm. and the opportunity comes gradually as well but <laughs> if I will come back no I will have the fourth product even started in 20, uh, uh, 30, uh, tw uh, uh, 218, mm -hmm. and I uh, uh, have much <laughs> less dilution that I get when <laughs> I <laughs> really Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, that's the Okay, yes. uh, six uh, months for you, Pierre Paolo, six months. So Do my more? key lesson, and I just learned it, is I should have come to Saudi. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it took me, it took me uh, 32 months in Colombia to get the license. <laughs> oh. Uh, going on 20 in Mexico, we still not confirmed, and in Argentina it took us 24. So, uh, and we're on two other processes that one of which has been going for over 18 months. Okay. And um, you know, I would say that the thing I learned is that the key is competition, allowing competition and having regulation that fosters competition. The problem in many emerging markets, unfortunately, is that because the incumbents cannot fight on product. We ship product every week. If there, somebody gets fired at Wildlife, we don't ship a product every week. And so that level of iteration and change is not normal in, in established incumbents where they're you know, um, much slower and they don't have a culture of continuous innovation. And so because they cannot compete on product, they compete by lobbying the regulator to yeah. block competition. Yeah. And so from the banks not sending you money live, when I launched, um, the, the banks took 96 hours to send money to the fintech. So I credited the money live, and then they took 96 hours. Um, and you know, even today, in, in places like Colombia, uh, the, the, the banks charge you a fee to send money to a different account. And so if we want to think about prosperity for all, we need everyone to understand that the rents that are protected mean that development is slower for everyone, and mean that growth is slower, prosperity is slower, and then the winners take all the profits and they keep the rents. And what we need is for real capitalism to thrive is competition. So we need licenses to be issued in six months and for there to be new licenses, not like countries in Latin America where there's one country I won't mention where there hasn't been a single new license since 1985. <sighs> and so that's a problem. And, and in the case of, of digital inclusion and financial inclusion, this is particularly important because going back to the theme that you described in the beginning, if we do not if so much new value is going to be created online and we don't give everyone the possibility to transact online, they're completely out of the system. And so they cannot get um, Spotify and they cannot get a Netflix account. That also means that they cannot pay for added services or create their own. And so I think that competition is what we need to foster. Okay. And when you get bigger, it's very uh, attractive to become the monopoly that you of fought course, yeah. against. And we really all need to resist that and ask for the regulators to be clear that we need real competition because that's also what pushes capitalism further. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have heard so far that we need a vision and this vision very clearly needs to be driven by the government. They have a role to play to create the right place for competition to take place, the right investment in the, in the right, uh, let's say, business opportunities. For DCO, clearly this is not happening in one place. This is happening internationally, right. cross-border. So to have a, a successful digital economy, we need to work across border. We need to have cooperation in terms of data flow, people movement, investment, talent. And Jen, I would like to hear now from you. This is something I, 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 you have spent a lot of time thinking about. What do you think has, can enable the cross-border interaction and cooperation to really support all these elements of the digital economy? Oh, I will just use TikTok as an example just based on my personal experience. Uh, you know, mobile really took off, at least in China in 2020, uh, sorry, 2012. 
So I think the right infrastructures, that, as we mentioned, is not only access to internet, but also we look at smartphone penetrations. Right, China has about 70, over 70 smartphone penetrations. And a lot of, I would say, rising countries have more, uh, I would say the, the, the pe smartphone penetration rate is much higher than some of the developed countries where they have old PCs and all those. So we're looking at an era that you shift from PC to mobile. So the right, uh, I think, the smartphone penetration and the right bandwidth enabled people to have access to, uh, I, I would say, information, but not only text information, but also multimedia information, information in different format. So you have, you have when you have um, Apple, you have App Store operating system like Android, it enabled developers globally to be cre to very creative, to create a new tools, apps, to enable, I would say, users, consumers, uh, people, uh, in Africa, in India, and in a lot of countries to really freely create content. And not only in text format, but also pictures, videos. I think those actually multi multimedia format information is really, I, I think it's like a flu, like people can share, people can really have yeah. run as age, people can you know, have a lot of comments through those, and not only uh, Twitter, and, and others, so just Twitter is great, everyone is using Twitter, um, and I think that's another layer. Infrastructure, then the operating system, the tools enable developers to do, you know, you have different filters, you have cameras, all those would enable information to be creative and then to be shared. And I think the third layer is, we call it, everyone knows, network impact. We look at in the region, is there enough density, mm. right? We look at you know, I, I don't know, but in a lot of we can look at the uh, uh, daily active users, monthly active users to see if it can reach half a million, million. What is the minimum threshold so that you would have the connections within, the, you would create a communities and people have connections. You know, that's why, you know, yesterday WhatsApp was down, right, two hours. And I think a lot of people in this conference panicked, right, what's going on because they cannot, cannot connect. So I think that you mm. need to have the first, we call it a cohort or clusters. You need to meet that threshold. I think that's the third layer. Mm -hmm. That's how information can be flowed freely. And what hasn't, right? There's a second part of the questions, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the perfect solution. But what hasn't worked, except that Alexandro is showing me that we have to close. I can't believe we already <laughs> exhausted oh. the time. Oh, okay. So, so, that's so, so what has not? I think, I think we, just will, we will close the door and we continue the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't trust these guys. Um, sorry, I have to stop now. No, I think that course. was the last question for us today, and uh, that's very unfortunate. I hope we can continue, we can have Thank maybe you. other conversation moving forward. Uh, I'd like to have at least one question from the audience, because it's also part of how we create this, uh, this dynamism. But please keep it short. You will select the, the candidate. <laughs> we keep it short so we can answer it. Anyone from the audience wants to, to add something or just create more diversity in the perspective? Fantastic. No? So we have more time back. How much? One minute? OK, uh, that's not even enough to thank you, because uh, really, uh, I need more time to thank you to, to share your perspective. Really, uh, all elements you have added to this lab can create amazing, uh, amazing stories. I hope we keep in touch. We keep this conversation going. Uh, we will, there is clearly a, a direction we are taking to, build, uh, to enable digital prosperity for all. But uh, that's only possible by connecting the, this diversified perspective uh, where we create more uh, ideas and, and more opportunities. So please give a last and big round of applause for my panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.